slides then uh, or then what I could talk on. So I'll, I'll just go on the, on the parts which I think is of main interest. And of course, then you can ask me a couple of, I mean, the questions you want. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, so first of all, thank you for the invitation. And I really appreciate speaking with all of you and I hope I can have the opportunity to meet you in person. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm chief researcher here at the Technology Innovation Institute, which is a new, I'll talk about it in two slides, which is a new initiative, which is brought by Abu Dhabi to construct some kind of Frana for Institute in the Middle East uh, uh, in terms of, of, of applied research. I've been working before as the vice president of the research of Huawei and also professor at Central Superdeck, uh, having a chair of Bell Labs. And I've been involved at the interface of, I would say, mathematics, signal processing, information theory, and communication, with a lot more communication this last year with a focus around 5G and 6G, and also basically AI. So rapidly, uh, if you're interested to know more about TII, you can go on our website. So it's a public, public, publicly funded research institute based in the UAE. Same kind of approach as in Riyadh, if you want, or basically uh, uh, Chronifer I was talking about, which is supported by the Advanced Technology Research Council. And the main idea is basically to uh, develop a top research, uh, research institute here in the UAE uh, uh, by attracting top talents and making basically some contributions in terms of research, which have basically a, an impact. You have to know, I think uh, many of you do not know that much, basically, uh, the UAE and also Abu Dhabi, but it's the third most innovative economy in the Middle East and North Africa, if you're not aware of that. The first one is Israel, with whom we have a lot of close contacts at the moment. We have a lot of relations between the, the UAE and Israel, especially at university level with Technion and others. And the second one is, is Turkey, and the third one is the UAE. And today, the UAE is ongoing into a big transformation towards what they call the uh, knowledge economy by going from what we call an oil-based economy. And uh, I think the kind of model which is being put here is more or less what you would have for Abu Dhabi, Singapore, where Dubai would be more or less a model like Hong Kong at the moment. And we're seeing, by the way, a lot of big transformation with respect to that from Asia towards this Middle East region going on. And here you have roughly, to finish, the kind of, of objectives that we're attracting. Uh, the, the first is, of course, to attract the brightest scientific minds. The second is uh, work on concrete problems uh, which have a huge impact on our society. Climate change, uh, basically uh, renewable energies, AI, and all these things. And of course, to become a world leading research and development institute in this transformation that I was talking about just previously. My talk will be given in three parts. Uh, maybe I will not insist on some of the parts because some of you may be familiar with that. I'll do an introduction. Then talk about basically uh, centralized AI design for network on which basically the approaches related to games have appeared uh, also quite rapidly in that. And then I'll talk about the most interesting part, which is at the heart of all the networks today, which is what we call the distributed AI design and which we're looking at more mean field game approaches to solve those problems and trying to understand uh, these kind of approaches around that. Uh, this has led, of course, also a lot of work recently that I've been doing with a couple of, of people that you know in France, uh, especially when I established uh, 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 the Lagrange Center in Paris, which had as an aim to work on some fundamental problems. And mean field game theory came up as uh, one of the key items. And I'll talk why it's so important for us. So first of all, the main reason why uh, we're working on these, I would say, distributed design and mean field approaches. I think uh, you're not familiar with uh, the telecommunication industry, but the telecommunication industry has been going towards basically a lot of different waves. 2G, as you all know, uh, has a big success, which is mostly related for mobile for voice. To, in the year 2000, we uh, put forward something called 3G, which was aimed for mobile for data. Then in 2010, something else came up forward, which is mobile for internet, and that's what we call 4G. By the way, this is just a small anecdote. We were so focused in providing mobile for internet, meaning having the same kind of seamless experience that you have outdoors as you have with the wireless ADSL, that we forgot, I wouldn't say we really forgot, but voice was not basically the kind of thing that we were looking for 4G. And you have to know that in 4G systems, voice is considered as an application and not a technology that we have as in 2G. And uh, 
uh, for your information, that caused a lot of problem because since it's an application, we developed something like a voice over IP. It's called, in fact, voice over LTE. And it turned out that a lot of problem happened when we start selling the phones or 4G phones is that the quality of a call on a 4G system is worse than a 2G system. So you can imagine you start giving and selling phones to people. They can browse on the internet when whenever they make a call, it's very bad. So that caused a lot of problem and that also hindered on my case the need to look more into detail into what we call AI-based approaches to improve basically uh, the quality that you have in a voice over IP system. Because as you all know, whenever you work on AI systems, uh, you have this black box approaches and you're trying to look at end-to-end -end performance metrics that you try to improve rather than looking at all the details. And it worked quite fine. And today we deploy these AI-based voice over LTE systems, which have very good performance, by the way. Uh, 5G came in, and it's starting now nearly everywhere. You're taught, you have the terms IoT coming in, which is, means Internet of Things, and for which Mobile for Things happened. And what we're aiming at the moment, and this is a big convergence that we're seeing today with all these distributed approaches, to provide what we call Mobile for Intelligence. That intelligence is embedded in what we call machines. And one of the big things that people are trying to develop today is what are the kind of network that you can build for connecting all the different intelligence that are talking to each other. When I mean intelligence, meaning that you have distributed AI systems, and then you have to build some kind of network to be able to connect these things with all the latency. And 6G is trying to target that, by the way. And this is what uh, attracted a lot of interest in my research related to 6G and the connection with AI. Of course, I think many of you work for Google. Uh, federal learning systems are part of that. But that's only one part of the story because you're trying to develop a network with all the signaling that you can build so that you can connect and learn distributedly some kind of inference function. And this is what we're going to aim in the future because we're going to have this plethora of things embedded with uh, intelligence and for which we need to build up the network for that. And uh, in terms of network, as you all know, the bandwidth is important. You need to understand how many bits you need to, uh, let's say, uh, distribute across the network. The latency is important. The scaling on how you do it, are you going to do it in this clusterized banner and other things, which are reminiscent of ideas that you have whenever you look at interactive uh, things which are uh, with intelligence over there. Uh, I think this is very important because it will also showcase basically the rise of what we call native AI networks in a large scale. And I think what's going to happen in the next year, respectively for 6G, for example, is going to be interesting with the community of people working mostly in machine learning and AI to go in developing what we call not AI for networks, but how you build networks for making the best benefit of AI. What is the interconnect you need to build? We know it, by the way, already in computers today. Okay, in computers, we are already looking at problems related to if you want to compute faster, we know that you need to react architecture the way, whole way uh, the design of von Neumann was made uh, more than 70 years ago. And if you look now at a network, it's a much more larger scale where whenever you had a computer, the main idea was to move the data where the computing was. Okay, Communication networks are the same. What you do in general, you move the data where the computing is, and the computing is in general in the cloud. And today we know that to be more efficient and to cope with the constraint that we have, which are privacy, latency, coverage, we need to move the computing where the data is. So in the, com in the computing scenario or, or people work on processors, you have all these ideas of in-memory pro processing, which are in the realm of what we call post von Neumann, basically kind of computing. In, ne in networks, it's the same idea that we have today. When you look at federated learning systems, that's what you do in general. You don't move the data anymore. You try to move the computing to where the data is, and then you have some kind of signaling which leverages all that. If you do distributed reinforcement learning techniques are also related to that, and we'll talk about all these scenarios more precisely. Before going uh, into details about the approaches on distributed AI, I'd like to hinder a bit of, on, on the history uh, related to the connection that we have related to networks and AI, and also this distributiveness I'm talking about. There's a famous paper of Claude Shannon that I strongly encourage to, you to read, which is called Programming a Computer for Playing Chess, and for which basically already the questions of using AI and networks are already there. And if you read the papers, he was already talking about using AI to improve the systems. And uh, if you that's an extract from the paper, 
And you can read it here that the idea is to, to design machines for designing filters, equalizers, machines for designing relay and switching circuits, machines for performing symbolic math mathematical operation, and machines capable of logical deduction. And if you read in detail that paper, of course, he expresses what everybody had as an issue at that time, which was the computing power. And if you do that, and chess is a good example, then the amount of time it takes you to do the different steps is quite large compared to what a human would be doing. And of course, we know as of today why these kind of papers and approaches, which were uh, already uh, highlighted more than 70 years ago, work now is because of these three things that you're all aware of, which is the storage, let's say the big data approach, the uh, computing basically capability that we have today, and the new types of algorithms that we have today. On the other aspects, which is basically networks for AI, meaning if I have a lot of intelligent entities around me, which have basically deep neural network, how do I connect them? There was also another paper of Shannon, basically talking about another way of looking at what we call Shannon theory. And this is what we call level A and level B, by the way. And now it's incurring a lot of work for information in the communication society. So level A is the classical problem of defining a notion of information, which is related to the number of bits it represents and through a notion of entropy. But then if you want, and, and, and the idea behind is that every time you communicate, while well, you communicate from scratch, from the beginning when you do communication. And every time you recommunicate with your mother, for example, it's a communication from scratch. Level B, which was highlighted by Shannon and for which now everybody's jumping, is the fact that if you have intelligence entities which are communicating, the more you communicate, the less you need to communicate after because you start building what we call a context. And the main reason is that in the classical communication model of Shannon, memory was not there, meaning once you communicate, you don't store the past. Now, we know that if you store the past of your communication, you can create some kind of model between a transmitter and a receiver. And by creating what we call a distributed model, then you can basically create some kind of context. Today, this is called for information, called, it's called semantic communication. We have, of course, semantic com computing, but semantic communication represents exactly the fact that the more you communicate, the less you need to communicate with basically some kind of smartness that you put inside. Uh, there are a couple of very interesting papers which look at the way that these designs have, have to be made. And this leverages, of course, the whole idea of how you build distributed AI systems, which have at the same time computing power, but also storage power and in which you're going to beat some, some models. Now, another also introduction I want to do, uh, which is also important to give a bit of, of facts on the historical before we start, just to tell you that we don't start from scratch, is also in the communication society, learning is not new. I think you're all familiar with the, the famous book. Uh, uh, at that time, it was called, by the way, Le Peril Jaune. So the cover was not like that because it was so hard to get into uh, the, the cryptic way of Norbert Wiener and how he wrote. But in any case, that's taken from his book. And the picture, were, by the way, was, was uh, it's in French because uh, the editor was French. It was well called Herman. And you have to know that uh, we've been using all these ideas of learning in communication. So it's not new. And it's something that was happening without the notions of, let's say, deep learning or uh, reinforcement, deep reinforcement learning that you're hearing about now today. And for which, basically, we know that if you want to transmit some information from point A to point B without knowing your environment, then what you're going to do is a feedback loop. And what's happening with the feedback loop is that, of course, you're going to learn progressively how to trigger your input so that you target your output. At that time, the notion of output was called the MMSE, the minimum mean square error, which was some kind of quality of service that we had at the time. Uh, and the main reason, of course, that you do that is that not only you can find the right feedback mechanism that you can do, but you can also prove things. So what, what are the kinds of things you can prove? And our community, especially the wireless communication community, has been implementing these algorithms, you have to know, without even looking at the notions that we're looking today with all the approaches. And this plethora of algorithms that you see on the right are things that have been implemented in wireless. It goes from best response dynamics to fictitious display. I'm sorry, there's a mistake, reinforcement learning, Joint utility strategy learning, trial and error learning, regret matching learning, Q learning, multi arm bandits, and imitation learning. And of course, each one has its own advantage and caveats depending on the kind of observation you do. Are you observing the action 
are you observing the kind of utility? And based on that, we're able to trigger that. Moreover, we're all, also, as you all know, whenever you start implementing those algorithms without even talking about uh, uh, things related to AI or machine learning, is that we can prove things. You can prove convergence. And when it, does not when it does not converge, I think you're all familiar with that, is that you start looking at not any more than instantaneous kind of utility, but you're looking at an expected value of your utility. And the main reason, of course, you, you look at expected utility is that in general, you want to convexify the function. And if you convexify the function, then of course, you can prove things very neatly in terms of convergence properties. Of course, when you look at, at expected utilities rather than your fixed utility, then of course, uh, the kind of optimization is not anymore some kind of vector uh, with the, basically the parameters, but it's a, a vector of probabilities. And you go into what we call mixed strategies. And I think many of you are familiar with this notion of mixed strategies. Now, the main reason uh, this has been applied but did not work is two. And I think it's very important for you to understand that. Uh, the first reason is that usually when people are working in wireless, uh, they want to have some kind of metric that they maximize, which is called a rate, meaning you want to have a communication system which is built on the possibility of having 10 megabit per second, for example. Now, if you tell that I'm designing a system where I have an average rate of 10 megabits of system, people are not happy because an average rate, meaning it means that you have 10 megabits on average. So it may happen that you have nothing and a moment when you have a lot and it, it fluctuates. This is the kind of things where customers just run away. So in general, you need to define a metric which is more related to what we call an outage probability. We try to optimize the system such as 99% of the cases we're able to ensure a minimum rate of 10 megabits. If you start looking at those kind of utility functions, in general, they don't have at all the right properties. And then you're a bit lost in terms of proving things in the system and how the system will behave. Second thing also, which is not good about all the approaches that I'm showing here, is that we are in a domain where the environment on which you're going to be doing your feedback changes. Why it changes? Because you have mobility, meaning a guy enters, a guy goes out, uh, you request something. So the kind of, 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 of changes that you have in your time scale are not compatible, which means that you have a problem which is related to the fact that by the time you learned how to optimize the parameters of your computer, for example, it's too late, things have changed. So for that, let me give you just an example. You have two laptops, okay? Which is a very interesting, very simple game nature in terms of what you do. You have two laptops and you have two access points. And this is a very good example on how you can train your students for a given example. Usually the choice of the Wi-Fi hotspot is done by hand, which meaning that you open the Wi-Fi and then you click on it. And if you click on it, how you're going to do it, you're going to do it by choosing the one which has the highest number of bars, okay? But your neighbor, which is beside you, will also do the same without looking at your computer. And of course, each one of you wants to maximize his rate so that he can download the file. Now, it turns out that if both of you chooses the same access point, then the number of bars that you see will diminish because you have basically shared spectrum, which is happening, okay? And so what happens is you're not happy because basically the number of bars. So you're going to click and go to the other access point. And then if you go to the access point, you're not happy, so you're starting to have a ping pong effect. So of course, what you would like to do is first to come up with a software which does the choices in a distributed manner of assigning each of the laptops to an access point, such as everybody's happy. Okay, that's your first goal when you design a system. So, of course, you want to design it. Now, if the design is accessing an access point, well, you can show that if it's the rate, you, it, the system is not going to converge and you may fall in this, in this ping pong effect. The other is to define a strategy which looks at the average rate where you will choose access point one with probability P1 and choose access point two with probability one minus P1. And the other will do. And there you can show how the system will behave and converge. And here you have these two caveats. First, you're optimizing the function that Adana gave you at the beginning, which was not interesting at all because I told you about the rate, but not the average rate. And second, also thing that happened is that while you do this thing, there's maybe a third guy who's coming in in between. 
afford guys. So the, the kind of scenario changes and also the environment changes, meaning a guy passes through in front of the access point and all the parameters have changed across time. Okay. And so what I mean by that things in that scenario did not work. And you have to know this opened the whole door in the community of wireless networks called SUN. SUN means self-organized network for information, meaning having networks which have the ability automatically to find on their own how to tune optimally the parameters to access the different basically uh, uh, base stations or access points and also trigger in terms of how much power they will send, things like that. Now, of course, quite rapidly, we started also to look in that scenario in, in, in the case of adding memory in that and exploiting the past experiences that I had with the big data approach. Today, for information, this is a lot of work which is happening. It's called AI-based SUN, AI-based self-organized network. And the idea is, of course, if you track all the data that you gather from the different choices that you have done in the past, you can create a model of that, and of course, you can explode through deep reinforcement learning techniques to be able to improve on your convergence time. And it's mostly about how you converge faster by exploiting all the different, I would say, kind of choices you made, meaning that at 6 o'clock on Tuesday, the choice that you made on an access point is registered. On Friday at 8 o'clock, so you have all the different choices that were made, which were successful, and then you try to interpolate on those different with still some kind of feedback word, which you're using around that. I hope this at least was clear as an introduction just to give you what's actually today the state of the art. Of course, uh, today, for the people who are using AI-based sun technique, we'll talk about it. We have the problem of scaling. In general, we're able to trigger the system when there's one, two players, three players, but then when the system scales, then we don't know at all how to do. When you have a lot of, of things, and this, of course, goes to what I think many of you are familiar with, is that whenever you have a scaling problem, then there are two things. Either you solve it and have an explicit, either you don't, and then you explore the dimension. And by exploding the dimension, you go into a mean field approach on which all, the, I would say, the non-relevant parameters, this is classical in statistical approaches, disappear and only the parameters of interest appear. That's the first thing. Second thing also we do when we are tackling this kind of problem is to look at what we call the exploration versus exploitation phase. Meaning we have a problem, the number of parameters that we need to optimize becomes quite large because we have too many players, because we have too many parameters. The time scale that I told you where in wireless goes too fast, then what we're gonna do is reduce the learning space. So this is also some things that we have tried in the community Without too much success, I have to admit, in looking at if a problem is too large, how to cluster it so that people explore a subset of the dimension of a system, space, time, frequency, and, others, and then they exchange some kind of parameters to enable the convergence. Another thing also that I have to tell you also in this introduction, which is a big long, but it's important to understand the kind of, of effort that the community has been doing is also trying to understand whenever we build a system, what is the price of anarchy, okay? And the price of anarchy, I think you're all familiar with that. Basically, it gives you the cost of decentralization. In the example, I gave you the two access points. You could do a very centralized system where the access point has the different bars and they both decide jointly on telling to this terminal, you go with me and this terminal goes with me. So, of course, the caveat of having a centralized system is that, of course, there's a lot of basically overhead in terms of signaling that you pour in the system because you need to learn all the devices, what are their status in terms of bars, okay, and then basically come up with a centralized algorithm that gives them the information. It doesn't scale, and by the time, in general, you centralize all that information, same problem that I told you before, the whole kind of configuration has disappeared. There's a new player which came in with his laptop in the classroom, one guy who shut down his computer because he didn't want to have access and things like that. But said that, we were very, I would say, kind of lucky because we have in our community a rule of thumb. And that rule of thumb came up with a lot of work which has been done uh, because in general, the first question that is asked is should you centralize or decentralize the system quite rapidly? So we have a rule of thumb which is related to the price of anarchy where uh, Things have been already studied in terms of looking basically uh, 
depending, I would say, on the kind of function or, or utility that you try to optimize, we're able to give you some kind of bound on how much the overhead is going to be. And this is our results quite known. If the kind of utility function is affin, then the price of our key is roughly bounded by four third. Okay. Now, if it's a polynomial of degree two, degree three to degree P, then you have also quite rapidly when you design a system, basically an upper bound on the price of anarchy. So it tells you basically if the overhead in terms of gathering all the information is more than one third. If your affin, uh, affin uh, uh, utility, if your utility is, is, is of the affin type, then basically then it's better to go towards a centralized system. And if it's more than 60% for degree two, degree eight, three, and then of course, if it's any continuous function bounded, then you can come up with some kind of things trick to come up already with the price of an key before going deep in the design of the system. I will not insist on that. The community has been also working uh, and I've been also one of them working uh, a lot uh, uh, on this is coordination. And this is also one step basically which enables you to uh, uh, provide also some gains without looking at the complete basically distributed system and looking at coordination mechanism and which you can exploit to coordinate the system. And these are kind of works that I've been doing with the, with with the, with colleagues from INRIA, like Ethan Altman for a couple of years and showcasing that a lot of protocols that we build, if we add a bit of coordination, then we can improve drastically the performance related to complete distributed system and uh, with respect to centralized uh, system. I will not talk about that, but I would like just to mention that this kind of protocols have been applied to a very famous protocol called Slotted Aloha. So I think you're not familiar maybe with communication, but in general, when you have two devices which need to talk to a base station, the first question is, they need to talk, just like a classroom. Imagine you have a, a teacher and you have two students. And so if you have two students, what happens is that uh, they have to talk without the teacher telling to which one he has to talk. So in general, if one talks and the other does not talk, so the message passes and the teacher can hear. The teacher, by the way, is the access point or the base station. The two uh, 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 students are the two terminals. I hope it's clear. Now, if they speak at the same time, okay, then you have a collision and then you cannot understand. And this is what happens in system. And so in our system, this is what we do is that when the system scales, so when the system is, is not scaling, meaning we know that there's always eight people in the system, we have systems which are very well designed, which are very centralized. This is called basically TDMA, meaning the first one talks, the second talk, the third one talks, and the fourth and fifth, and then you do round robin, okay? Time, TDMA means time division multiple access. You divide the time of the speakers in time. However, if you have a lot of users, it's not easy to divide the guys in time. Why? Because not everybody is going to talk. There are some people who do not want to talk in a classroom. And second, if you do it in a TDMA manner, it may happen that the guy who has an interest of talking would wait a lot of time before he talks. It's like in the class, if you have 40 students and say, you talk first, you talk second, by the time each one talks, the whole time of the course has finished. So in one way you tell the people, just talk whenever he has some interest to talk. And so in the scaling, what we do, we implemented, it's implemented, it's called slotted aloha, meaning you talk. If there's a collision, okay, what you do is that, meaning another guy talks at the same time, on your own, you choose a random number in a window and your neighbor chooses random number. Hopefully the two guys will not choose the same number. And then you retalk after a certain delay corresponding to the number of slot that you chose. So if I, if we both collide, on my own, I would choose the number randomly eight, and my, my, my other colleague would choose on his head a number six, and the probability that we get the same number is very low, and then we go on like this. And this is, by the way, how, for information, Wi-Fi works, okay? When Wi-Fi works, you have all the computers which are logged, and they access the system randomly, and if there's a collision, they choose the system. The problem with these systems is that, of course, the more users you pump in, if the window is fixed in terms of the random number that you choose, the higher the collision is, okay? And just for information, you can improve that system, which is totally distributed in terms of how you select and what is the window, basically some kind of correlation where they can correlate the strategies and improve their system 
And this is just for information. I can give you papers on that, but we also try to apply the setting to be able to improve the performance that we have. Okay? Now, why now the game has changed and we think we can make more progress is, of course, due to the fact that all this were not enabled with this AI approach, meaning adding a bit of experiences that you gather with the data and on which you can exploit things to go further, okay? And uh, the reason, of course, I told you why today we can do it and we cannot do it before is that now our system have a lot of memory, meaning that if you take the Shannon approach of 1948, that's the model he had, if you look today, well, now we can compute and create the context whenever we communicate and gather. So if you talk to your mother, the more you talk, the more, the less you need to talk to have the same information embedded. And so what I mean is also you can gather more and more experiences and improve your system in terms of co convergence in a distributed manner. I will not talk why now this is happening. I think you're all familiar with the big waves around uh, the years which happened around that and makes it that happen. And of course, the approach which is reused, being used today is to ask ourselves, well, if we have a large system on which each of the devices has a DNN, a deep neural network, how the system will behave basically by adding on top of these learning algorithms the fact that we have implemented a neural network over there. Now, of course, the reasons I jump on that, I think you're all familiar with AI. The main reason that today the problem came in is, of course, we thought about it. And I think we thought, we thought, we, we thought about it, we, uh, we thought about it since many years. But the biggest progress today which has been made is that we can embed now AI on the edge, which was not something quite easy to do. Meaning today we're able to design, and I worked many years on that, what we call neural processing units directly on the phones, directly on IoT, which enable to do at the same time the kind of learning mechanism that I was talking with feedback, but also basically some neural network, which is embedded by creating the model that it has learned based on the various experiences that you have around that. Uh, and of course we can do it because the progress of many companies is, has been so outstanding that we can bring a lot of the processing that we were doing directly on the edge. So we can move the computing directly on the edge and ask ourselves if we have so many NPUs which are distributed and which need basically to take a decision and on top of these classical feedback mechanism, how would the system work when you do that? And this is the big question that is being asked in the community. By the way, just a small remark, when you start building, and I worked uh, a couple of years on that, when you start building basically neural processing units directly on the device, the kind of uh, architecture that you are quite familiar with the classical DNN also changes. What I mean by that is that you have much more constraints due to the fact that you have some uh, energy and power constraints, which makes it that you cannot compute it in the same way. Just to give you an example, suppose that in your neural processing unit, you impose that the weights can only take zero and ones. Okay, you're going to something from floating points to low resolution. Okay, then if you do that, uh, you cannot anymore do a stochastic gradient descent because you cannot do a derivative. Okay, and then the problem, of course, is how you design now a system which will learn okay, based on the data that you gather without doing a stochastic gradient descent. So I think you're quite familiar with that. There's a whole community which has been working on what we call binary neural networks, which look at these cases. And the general idea is that uh, if you look at the problem of learning, the problem of learning is nothing else than the problem of optimization. And if I tell you that now your question is to optimize based on the fact that you only have zero and ones, then this is combinatorial optimization. And combinatorial optimization is at the heart of what people do in what we call coding and decoding. And then the gates is, are quite open in terms of different types of architectures. And we built a couple of our architectures a couple of years ago uh, when I was working at Huawei in terms of building neural processing units, which are of the DBNN type, which have these, I would say, coding mechanism to be able to build on that. But what I mean by that is, of course, the whole problem becomes quite interesting in the sense that uh, you start having not only the problem of exchanging information, which has bandwidth constraint, but also the kind of computing that is bandwidth constraint is, is constrained by the kind of, of, of resolution that you have. And you need to rebuild the whole system totally differently in the way you do it. Okay. 
And so, of course, uh, the question uh, that is arising now today is uh, once you go out from a classical system to more distributed system and, and, and the collaborative, how do you build it by going towards these techniques? And uh, this is a bit of what I'm going to talk about right now and which is at the heart of the work I'm doing with collaborators is trying to reassess the whole approaches around the mean field uh, 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 approaches to try to design systems which have AI capability and look at how these problems converge and how we can design algorithms. To do that, I want to kickstart with a very specific example, which is not at all AI uh, related and with which we already looked at how to understand better the scaling of uh, devices which have to go to this access point that I was mentioning. Okay. So you remember the base station here that I'm talking about are the access points. The different, I would say, uh, mobile phones that you see are the laptops in my example. And the big question we have in general in communication, which is as a start, is you have a bunch of terminals, you have a bunch of access points. What is the best user access point association problem? We call this also user cell association problem. Okay. So if you do it in a centralized manner, I told you before, it doesn't scale. A lot of information that needs to be gathered in looking at all the different cases, it's combinatorial. If you do it in a distributed manner, then of course it doesn't scale. And there, of course, the approaches which are related to mean field turned out to be quite neat in how you do, how you do these things. So let me give you just an example of how you solve such a problem. Well, you have each user who has to choose the best, uh, what we call small base station. SBS means small base station, but this is nothing else than the access point I was talking about. Among its different options. So it's really a user-centric approach. After selection, we'll receive a reward based on the congestion level of the small base station and the channel gain between itself and the small base station. What it means, it means that once you access, in general, immediately the access point, you see it on your computer, you have the bars. And once you go on an access point, if somebody else goes, the access points, the bars can go down or, or stay the same depending on the congestion you have. And it will depend also on the link you have. So the closer you are from an access point, the higher the number of bars. But at the same time, the more others go on your same access point, the less you have rate at the end. Okay. And your goal is to try to solve an optimal control problems for selecting the, the SBS over the time. And of course, the network is dense, meaning you have a lot of terminals and you have a lot of access points. This is another part of the story is what is considered as a lot. And these, of course, simulation will tell you if eight uh, is a lot or not. Then the second thing also that comes in is that in general, users who are close by in general have a tendency to use also the same kind of strategies. And the main reason is the fact that there's much more chance that a guy who's very close to you to choose the same access point. And this is quite obvious because a guy who's close to you in general is very close from the base station. And there's no reason that his strategy would be different from the other, okay? And the idea is, of course, how to exploit that similarity between users to reduce the communication load between users and make the decision process faster in this case. The reward kind of function that is usually used is basically uh, the Shannon rate, which is basically RUS that you see here, which is uh, basically the B is the bandwidth. The more bandwidth you have, the more rate you have log one plus the power on which you're going to transmit the link h to you plus the noise that you receive uh, 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 on your computer plus all the interference of the others this is why the congestion is 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 related okay you have interference minus what we call the effect of congestion on sbs meaning the total number of other users who are connected also hit your rate which is a function of your reward function and then what you're going to do is try to optimize basically the rate. You see on the right, the R-U-S-T-X, X depending on your position physically, and T at which time you're, you're, you're having that rate. And then as usually when you look at the system, as I told you, is that there's some similarity. That similarity is, of course, the fact that the kind of decision you're going to be made is linked to how close the user is to you. So if the user is close to you in a physical position and at the same time, he has big chances to use the same kind of strategy to be able to do it. There's no reason, of course, that it's a square. This is something also as a metric that we learn 
in the system. So in general, it's a beta, I put a square here, but on a lot of data that we run, and this is where we start uh, running a lot of data uh, to, to learn basically what kind of metric we consider as similar for the Wi-Fi access. I put a two here, but in general, it's a beta, and that beta is a parameter that we on which we run our system and on which we're able to, to learn. And then you have this Gaussian kernel. I think you're a bit familiar with that. And then what happens is, of course, you come up with this Hamilton Jacobi or mean field game formulation on which you have these two equations, which is the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation that you that you run, and also the Fokker Planck equation, which is also enabling you uh, to find the, the strategy on which you build. Of course, here, as you all know, this is a second step, and I think some of you are familiar with that. You have, of course, the problem of solving these things. And one of the main caveat of the MFG approaches, from my point of view, but we can leave it for a discussion between us, is what I call the computational MFG part, which has also hindered a lot of effort in the wireless community to push MFG. So we tend to have a very nice explicit formulation, but then we don't know how to solve these two equations, meaning continuous wise we know, and then whenever we want to solve them, then we need to find what we call computationally a nice method. And this, by the way, has hindered a lot of efforts which were made because we're not able to find a very sophisticated uh, computational manner to do it. Recently, uh, the community in MFG, uh, and I think some of the attendees here have worked on that, have been trying to look at what we call AI-based solvers, which, this, as you know, is the new tendency today in, a, in, a, in, a, in EDP and, and others to basically use AI techniques to solve those equations, which in some sense is giving some very nice results. Uh, I haven't implemented the, those yet, but uh, colleagues have been showcasing me the results and I've been quite, uh, I would say, uh, uh, impressed by uh, the, the use of AI to solve MFG. And I think this is a real like big, I would say, step as far as I'm concerned in making uh, basically uh, the engineering of the techniques I'm showing right now a good thing. So of course, at the time when we solved these things, we didn't have these techniques, which are what we call the AI-based solvers from MFG. And then of course, we tried to transform the MFG problem into a Markov decision process problem. And then basically we solved the MDP, we use deep reinforcement learning to solve it. And we also uh, approximate the value function using the adaptive linear neural, neural networks. And then we train basically the neural networks using the woodruff half algorithm uh, with a certain probability. And here's just to show you that it works. And so what's interesting is that with a good system of around 10 base station, okay, with what we call here uh, 20 imitator user users, meaning they don't exploit any kind of similarity, and 20 non uh, sorry, 20 imitator users, which exploit similarity, and 20 non imitator users, which just behave classically, then we can show that the convergence time is much faster and we get the results in terms of convergence quite fast. And here you have some results on which we implemented and looked in the real system how it worked. And you can see here on the, on the red curve or the orange curve, you have the non imitator results in terms of time slots, meaning the number of times that uh, we, we trick the system, and imitator users, which you see there in blue, which take a lot uh, uh, less time to converge and converges quite faster and how it goes to the equilibrium state in terms of a very simple user cell association problem related to that. Uh, for the time I have, I just want to mention maybe two so I can, I can give you five minutes. We've been also applying, of course, for different cases related to IoT, which is also very important in terms of how the system can access and not just the rate, but also related to the connectivity. But I will not insist on, on that approach. Uh, and this is some work that we did with Pierre Louis Lyon uh, and, and Jean-Michel Lasserie in showcasing uh, cases of battery and how basically you can optimize the battery uh, in order using these mean field games approaches in terms of utility and getting some solution. Here again, we were stuck for information. Same case, it was before the AI-based solver for MFG era, if I could call it that like that. And we've been coming with explicit formulation but now I think we could revisit these problems by using more uh, of these AI approaches, which are, I would say, the, the, the CMFG, which I call the computational MFG, which I think will, will get some, some very important results. I'll, I'll give also just one, one other case, which is also quite important uh, for us. 
uh, that we worked on and 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 to give you also a hint on on the approaches and and the solvers that we need using uh, machine learning techniques is basically uh, distributed caching now, this example is quite known in the community and is not easy to solve because there's a lot of of of, uh, of cases related to the correlation in terms of data that you have but i don't know if you're familiar with caching so uh, the main idea around caching uh, maybe i can give you this example which is very easy so usually you have in your house a, an adsl line okay which comes and serves what we call your box uh, which is in general a box which serves you in Wi-Fi. In general, the ADSL line that you have, which comes to your house, has a rate, this is called a backhole, which is much more reduced than the Wi-Fi experience that you can have, okay? Because an ADSL line would give you maybe some kind like, like 8 megabits per second, whereas today if you buy boxes of Wi-Fi, IEEE 802.11a, for example, uh, you would get something like 54 megabits. So it seems that today wireless is doing better, except if you have fiber, than the classical copper line. Clear? And so to solve that caveat, it's quite easy to do it. The way you would do it is that you put memory in the box, okay? Meaning storage capability. That's the first thing. Second, you understand also that the kind of traffic which is happening in a network is mostly about videos. It's not about browsing on the internet, it's about videos. The majority of things that you're seeing are Netflix, movies, things like that, for which you're solicitating the bandwidth of your, of your backhaul a lot. And so to increase your wireless experience, one way to do it is to be more proactive. What I mean by proactive is to pre-store on the box before the person arrives, the catalog of movies that you're almost sure that there's going to be a hit. And so those, those kind of movies that you pre-store basically go on the night or before the guy arrives so that there's already in the box. And so when you solicitate, you don't need to go back in the cloud. You just need to get it from the box. Of course, it's related to the fact that you can predict things. But you have to know that as of today, in terms of catalog, the prediction capability is quite good. Meaning if you saw Rocky 1, Rocky 2, Rocky 3, Rocky 4, there's a big probability that you get Rocky 5. And so we have a good accuracy, which is another step that we do beforehand, of knowing what are the kind of movies you're gonna see, what are the kind of videos you're gonna download, and we can restore them already before, and this is called caching, okay? And it's called caching on the edge. And so this is already one step that I'm not going to formulate here, but you have to know that this is a big tendency of networks to be much more proactive in how they serve users by pre-storing the data near the user before he requests to improve basically the kind of experience that you have in terms of pinging quite fast. And the best way to ping quite fast is that you don't search very far away the data, but it's very, it gets very close to you. And as I told you, since the traffic is 80% or more data, this is a video, sorry, this is what's hindering the traffic. We can pre-store and make it there, okay? Second thing, of course, is the problem of accessing when you have different files and on which access point you're going to access point, uh, on, on which access point you're going to go and get them, okay? Because in general, it's not only on one. You are in an environment where you have different boxes and you need to know which one you're going to access and how these things are going to be split. So the system could do that in a centralized manner and pre-store everywhere, depending on all the information it has on all the users across uh, basically a town and know exactly at which instant it should go and based also on the size of the boxes. Because, of course, if you had unlimited size, by the way, of your box, uh, of your Wi-Fi box, for example, you could store the whole Internet there. Of course, the main constraint that we have, why it becomes a very interesting optimization problem also time dependent, is that in general, you have two terabytes of storage. And by the way, the new tendency arrived today and not before, because what I'm telling you are not new ideas, is the fact that storage prices have been going very down, okay? Bandwidth costs a lot of money, but now storage does not cost a lot. So you can store a lot of data anywhere you want. And so this is why we could go to these approaches. So this is a problem that you can formulate also in a mean field approach where users 
will tend to access the, the different, uh, basically, access points or base station to serve. And same kind of things, you look at every small base station caches a fraction of a file at time t. So not all the movie is there, but it's spread across the different, basically. And what you're going to gather is one fraction of here, one fraction of there to reconstruct the big file. And then an SBS downloads files k at a certain rate, and each user is also served at a certain rate. And then you have also some dynamics related to the storage, okay, that you can model with also the channel. And also you have an evolution basically on the download that you do, which is a random process at which fast, how fast it goes. And this is just to tell you that the kind of, of cost function goes exactly to the same kind I, as I told you before. You have some cost, which is the inter uh, SBS redundancy cost, the backhaul cost, the storage base cost, the, the in uh, what we call small base station redundancy cost. And then basically you try to model each base station with its individual state and the distribution of all the others over the state space. You have the state dynamics that you can model also with the cost function. And I'll finish uh, rapidly with that I, uh, in terms of equation. I think it's not the most important thing, but we can send, I can send you the paper. And then you go back also to the modeling of the problem I gave you with these two types of equations for which up to the recent, I would say kind of, of com computation MFG was not something we knew how to solve. And so we needed to convert and look at different options on how to solve these equations and numerically how to write what are the optimal caching control policy and you go like that. Okay, I think I'll, I'll finish with that so I can have time for questions. I have a couple of other examples, but I think uh, I, I'd better just uh, uh, stop sharing and answer your question and hoping that it was interesting. Thanks a lot, Merwan. Very, uh, very interesting. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions, but uh, but maybe maybe we can start asking if people in the audience have. So may, maybe I can start. Um, yes. uh, one of the questions I have, you, you mentioned at some point the use of correlated equilibria in, in yeah. uh, designing and uh, I'm I'm just curious. Um, so, so your point here is to reduce the, the price of anarchy, if I'm not mistaken, in the use of correlated equilibria. And so, so something which is not clear for me is, uh, so as a set of correlated equilibria can be quite large. I, how are you able to pick one which goes in the right direction in, in terms of uh, reducing the, the price of anarchy between the, the Nash and the social optimum? So th the way we do it at the moment is basically by choosing the kind of signaling function, which uh, basically makes the system converge. So typically uh, one way for us to make it, but this is not the way is to say uh, people, the, 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 the phones, when it, it's, they know when it's night or day. Okay. So that's a, an external signal on which they can coordinate their strategy because they know it's day and night. Okay. So we try to define what are the sensing capabilities on which the system will coordinate and, and choose those, I would say, uh, external signals on which we want the system to coordinate. So we limit basically the, the capability of which signal, uh, external signal, the, the, the system can, can, can coordinate its strategies. And of course, as you know, in coordinated equilibrium, it's up to the, to the phone or to the device to decide to choose or not that coordination signal. Yeah, thanks. Make, makes sense. It's in the design of, of the signal. Okay, makes sense. It's in the design. So one, one thing that we have, of course, at our level is that we can design the system. So that's already good, meaning we can make the choices of what, the, uh, what a phone can hear as an external signal, what the phone can see. And, and it's related to the apps it has. It can know if it's a time or, 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 or basically some kind of, 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 of temperature or, or, or night or day. But so it is an entry hard problem trying to select an, a correlated equilibrium with high welfare. Do you have any heuristic to solve it or? No, so the cases we did are quite simplistic, to be honest. Uh, we limited the, the scope, but of course, if you have a lot of external signal, then it becomes a combinatorial problem and there's many choices you can go on. Yeah. Hmm. And then of course you can fall on many suboptimum cases uh, where which it gets difficult. Yeah, I think the new trend, at least as far as I'm seeing with this, I would say more, so 
we were the community and I am also we're, we're working a lot on game theoretic approaches uh, to basically try to analyze how distributed system and networks were working. And I told you it opened the whole doors of what we call self-organized networks. For which many companies, me too, have been working on that. And the main reason in wireless it did not go through, I told you, was mostly about the convergence time uh, and basically the, the kind of utility that you need to choose, which makes your life difficult. And the only way we solved it is in general by taking these uh, mixed strategies, expected stuff, you know, just convexifying what, how, how much you can to function. As long as you can, you're happy with that. And it turns out it didn't work. Today, the, the two big trends which are happening is that uh, the scaling and the scaling problem was approached by this exploration versus exploitation problem. We did it, but then basically the still there the, there is some limitation on on how you go. And today there's two approaches to solve the problem. The first one is of course looking at the MFG approaches, which we knew by the way when it scales, but we didn't have the solvers. Okay. And solvers is very important because we compute the stuff, you know, it runs, it, it, it runs on the computer. So, and, and now we're seeing a lot of good things happening uh, by you guys, some of you guys, by the way, working on these solvers, which are quite interesting in, in coming with, 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 with software on which we can crash. The second thing also, which is quite interesting is uh, we don't, we're not any more interested by uh, rational behavior and looking at if the system is rational and going in, but asking a very simple question, if each terminal has a DNN embedded or some kind of neural network embedded, it can be something else, how would the system behave? Which is a different question, okay? In terms of, of learning process and how it scales. So this is another question. That question did not appear before for a simple question. The reason is that we didn't have the neural processing units which could be embedded in a large scale on all the devices. Today it's happening. It's the big revolution on what we call edge AI. Meaning AI is totally so much on the edge that we have it on smartwatches everywhere now at the moment. And so we have the chipsets to be able to run these things and start looking at having more and more decisions which are distributed. Okay. Today, of course, no network is building this, by the way. So it's still at the moment in discussions for information in the roadmap of standardization because we're not able to prove anything around that. We need to be sure that the system stabilizes, it works. The worst can thing happen is that we can't control the system. And no operator today is taking the risk of giving more and more distributed intelligence because of the risk it takes. It's very centralized for information. Uh, we would not make, for example, phones could decide on their own to choose the bands on which they're gonna transmit. It could converge, yes, but since we cannot prove it, we're afraid of interference. It could create in the system, typically, okay? I think, but these two major trends, I think, are revolutionizing. So the MFG with its solvers are great now. Uh, we need to go more into understanding better to which extent it solves a broad range of equations. And second is the understanding of the connection between basically distributed edge AI techniques in terms of how they behave and how they behave by scaling. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Very, very interesting. Very interesting, Milan. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And I think we have the showcase, meaning if you build up the the systems, uh, we can demonstrate them. I mean, we have a playground to do it. I mean, uh, it, it's devices. We have a playground. We run the software and we see how the system works. Oh, boom, that's it. And and we can we can showcase and if the throughput is better, uh, the amount of bandwidth, things like that, this is something we can implement easily. Yes, but in the case of you know uh, having these unpredictable DNNs in a phone, you would also be looking at metrics such as you know 99% of the time it would work, but <laughs> that one percent the DNNs go crazy. I, I mean maybe something else. Are you have you thought about these metrics? Well, the, the 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 kind of metric on which the people are quite familiar is what we call the quality of experience. So quality of experience is very hard to define. Uh, during a long time, it was defined as the quality of service. It's what you're talking, meaning in 99% of the cases, uh, I can ensure a minimum bit rate, for example, or something like that. And we've been going on. As of today, because of all the trend, people are more interested in what we call quality of experience, meaning that uh, what you seem happy with is not the same thing that somebody will be happy with. 
so we can make some utilities which are very personalized because you can have a good good rate but basically then the quality of stalling of your image is latency you care more about latency than just rate you know what i mean so the whole thing is embedded into a function that we learn on knowing what is the kind of utility that is of interest for you okay so the and and so this is ongoing by the way before what we were used to do is define some metrics saying He's interested in beta times the rate plus beta times the alpha times the stalling of his information plus gamma. So we're constructing some false, some, uh, some generic parameterized utilities. And we were learning those parameters that we constructed with the weights based on each user. And today we stop this and we say, OK, we're going to learn the utility directly on his satisfaction. And then we try to optimize that. And there's no cost optimization. I guess there is, right? Yeah, there's cost optimization. optimization. Yes. Yeah. So it's 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 an interesting way now of, of going forward. But I think the the big issue today is really about how distributed the networks could be in the large scale setting and what kind of architecture we come up with them. Because the architecture is, by the way, what you standardize. I didn't mention it. Is that you don't standardize machine learning algorithms. You don't standardize mean fee MFGs. You don't, you don't, this is not standardized. It's algorithmic cases. It's what is implemented. However, how the system will cut into pieces the system. What is the kind of uh, exchanges they need to do? How often they need to do it? You know, uh, every hour, every millisecond, things like that. These are things that are pushing the standard. So every device knows that whenever it goes to the system, it can only talk to its neighbor every minute, for example, or every second, Okay, which are the rules, basically. And this is what we are trying to do now, by the way, for 6G. I didn't mention it, but the, the realm of 6G is that we want to connect intelligence, and we don't know how to do it. <laughs> Mathieu, you had a question as well? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, you pointed out many interesting directions. Um, and I had the question about one one of the directions that you mentioned, which is like the AI-based uh, solvers. And so you say that this could be helpful for the types of problems you were looking at. So I was wondering what were maybe the main bottlenecks or the main difficulties that you know, made this problem uh, challenging and why you think maybe AI-based solvers could help uh, Solving them. Okay, that's maybe at the high level, but yeah. yeah. So uh, in the classical two equations that you have to solve, the big problem is that in general uh, we're able to solve them in very specific cases in the continuous case. Okay, in a very specific case, and in those specific cases we can maybe get an explicit formulation, but even then, then we're not sure to get it because it depends on the Brownian kind of noise motion that you do. The problem that we had is, of course, when you look at a problem, uh, we need to compute that basically without discretizing. I mean, get get the solution of that. And all these years, all the people who have developed the solution were not able to implement them on the phone. I cannot get the policy, okay, uh, explicit. And this is why the new tendency of uh, the community, which is working on these AI-based solver, turned out to be very interesting and getting basically some solutions to the problems explicit that we can implement. And we were stuck in knowing how now how to implement. I think now the big step is that we have implementation, I would say, perspectives related to that. Okay. okay. But I think you know it, Mathieu. I think it's the whole tendency today of using AI for solving mm -hmm. EDPs. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. this is getting a lot of momentum. Uh, I never thought, I, to be honest, I never believed so much in it because I thought that the boundary conditions in the problem in, in these things was very hard to tackle. Uh, but I saw some inter interesting problems, <laughs> interesting papers, which have approached this thing. But uh, when uh, when I was talking to some of the people, Jean Michel and, and others, uh, the boundary, I said, with, with the boundary conditions, no, it's not going to happen. It's it's too hard to, you know, you cannot. It's going to be too complicated. But it turns out that it seems that it's going on the right direction. Okay. Okay. Sounds interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, 
I don't think there are many more comments. So thanks, thanks again, Merwan, for your for your time and this uh, this interesting talk. I have to admit we are not that familiar with communication systems, so so very interesting for us to do the connections with our midfield approaches, kind of stuff we are working on, and what can be done there in terms of federated learning, for example. It's it's quite interesting.